Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants, and this is our first video of the new year, and I just came back from a garden club, and I just wanted to share this new concept with you, and hopefully you can share your cons you know, your feedback and your comments with us in the comments down below, and um, hopefully you can add some more insight and more value to this new concept, and I'm going to share a whole bunch of other gardening tips as it relates to apple tree care and behind me I've got my three-in-one apple tree here in the garden we're gonna get get into detail with it the topic of this lesson is can we force winter upon the apple tree by removing its leaves again I just returned from a garden club meeting where there's about 40 of us and about if three or four of them said yes you can in fact um, force winter upon the apple tree by simply removing its leaves and I've noticed from year after year, sometimes the apple tree, such as the one here behind me, and here we are now the ending the first week of January, somewhere between one third and two thirds of the United States is blanketed in snow, whereas here in Los Angeles, and again, this is the end of the first week of January, we're having days between 65 and 70 degrees. A little bit too warm, and there's still quite a bit of humidity in the air, and this tree is just gradually working its way into winter, but within a month, the other lesson too is, here in Southern California, it's spring by February. Even though official spring is March 21st, that's an average spring date for the country to gauge itself by. But the most cold parts of the United States are not gonna experience their apples and their figs and their um, peaches and plums and other fruit trees going into bloom until the weather warms up sufficiently for the plant to then wake up and then push out those blooms and those shoots. In this situation, and for the plants in our garden here in Los Angeles, that's gonna be February and at the latest early March, whereas for parts of New York, for instance, or um, up in Maine, or Washington and Oregon, and in those states, they're not gonna see the growth that we're gonna experience down here in Southern California until closer to later March, possibly April, and maybe even May. So um, again, depending on your growing zone, you're gonna experience growth at different times. But for those of you that are growing apples in a warmer growing zone, such as here in Los Angeles, California, this may be a helpful tip. And again, for those of you experts out there, and there was a, um, an arborist from UCLA that was at our garden club meeting as well, and he said, yes, in fact, this will um, help get your plant into winter and into winter um, dormancy faster by removing its leaves. So I'd love to hear from you um, about that. And while we um, accomplish that with the tree behind us, we're also gonna um, review some pruning lessons as well. So let's get started. So here we are now with the three-in-one apple tree. The um, tree in front, which has got the green ivy organics um, organic paint that's painted on here. We're gonna talk about the value of that in just a moment. But this green branch is the Gala Red variety of apple. The one in the min middle is a family favorite, greenish red flavor of apple that we've grafted. And then the one in the back over here, this one here is coated white. The one in the back that's coated with the ivory organic color brown um, is the Granny Smith green apple. So we've got red, reddish green and green all growing on the same root stock. It basically was one apple which started similar to this. If I can show you here with a grafted apple tree, the, if you take a look here at the label, this here was, it says on here, Granny Smith apple. You can see the green apples that are on here. What I did was I simply took a root and you can see over here, off of the root is a new sucker plant right here, which I'm wiggling. This here's a new sucker plant. I can now pull this out we can do it right now together. I'm gonna to pull it out and hopefully get a few roots. We pull, 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 and here we go. Luckily, there are some roots. And now we can use this little sucker, which was um, a Granny Smith apple tree. And with this label, what it said is that it was grafted on an M11 rootstock. And what M11 rootstock means is that it's gonna to grow to a standard height, somewhere between about um, 15 to 25 feet. So it's gonna be a fairly large apple tree and it's all gonna start off with this little root. This is what's gonna control the vigor of the plant under healthy conditions. This will reach 15 to 25 feet, and then through good, good pruning practices, um, you can now control the plant. So what I did was I took this root stock and then grafted onto it. I told you that the white tree trunk behind me is grafted with our family favorite reddish green variety of apples that we have been propagating for close to 30 years. And then if you take a look over here, 
what I did was I took this M11 rootstock, which is right here, and I grafted it right here with something called a cleft graft. And I'll put some links to the video link where um, we just explained how we created this cleft graft. And I actually have the video where this one here was created. Um, so take a look all the way around. And we're going to recode it with the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 plant guard um, before the end of this video, which we'll be doing together. So let me put this back into position. And the first thing we're going to do is take a look at the height of the tree. So we started off with these grafts that are around where my hand is, about a foot or two off the ground, all the way around. And since then, these trees, in just less than three years, are now measuring over 10 feet tall. There's two favorite times for pruning your apple tree. When it comes to your first year growth, which is on this apple tree right here, you can see that it's grown all the way from where my hand is to the top. So it's grown about five to six feet in just this one growing season. Our goal is to bring it back down so we can control the size of the tree so we can have fruit that are low hanging and easily accessible. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring it back to a manageable height. The goal within this garden is to keep everything predominantly within arm's reach. So we're gonna accomplish that right now. Let's check this out. So the first lesson to be conscious and aware of is you don't wanna prune it so severely that you lose all of your flower buds. So the first thing we gotta do is define what is the flower bud. If you come in a little closer here, the flowers are gonna emerge from these buds over here that are swollen. If you take a look here on the tip, another one right below it, that'll also turn into a flower bud. If you take a look into here as well, this here will also be a flower bud as well. And if you take a look within, flower bud, flower bud. Um, whereas tips such as these near the ends will typically result in a continuation off the shoot. But along the side when there's an extremely large amount of swelling, which these here are very small, so no activity is gonna happen here unless we prune near it, that'll actually result in some more leaves, but not a flower. So our goal is to preserve as many of these low-lying flower buds as possible, and we're gonna prune as much of the height and the vegetation off the tree. Another lesson that came up today is, can pruning encourage um, vigor? And the answer is yes. Um, during a lesson today, there was a lot of people that were confused, and again, it wasn't my lecture, so I wasn't able to um, interject here. But by reducing the height, imagine this, if I am the tree with my entire body with a similar proportionate amount of roots that are below the ground and basically stabilizing me within my position. If I remove an arm, I have now reduced, let's say if the arm represents 20% of me, I've now reduced my overall above ground structure by 20%, thereby increasing the below structure's ability to support the remaining 80%. So by removing some of the percentage existing above the ground, the roots are gonna be that much vigorously um, able to support the structure above the ground in addition to producing the best quality, best size, best flavor apples, as it's gonna have extra energy to put into that above structure tree. So um, I'm hoping that will be helpful in regards to, you know, some people are asking like, would it be more helpful to add nitrogen? Would it be more helpful to add more phosphorus to the soil? And the true answer is by having a healthy plant, which is happening just by having a lot of good compost and good um, mulch and by having good watering practices and all of these good lessons. And also most importantly is having an area for a fruit tree that requires a lot of sun is to make sure that there's a lot of sun on the plant because that's gonna help the plant accomplish all the metabolic processes and necessary health to support and maintain um, healthy tree structure. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna start reducing the height. I'm gonna have you guys watch me um, make a couple of prunes and then I'm gonna wrap this up as fast as I can. But if you're gonna come in a little closer, let's make this prune, first prune right here. So I'm gonna remove this branch um, that's coming out of this branch over here. I'm gonna go with my pruners. I'm gonna prune as close as possible like so. And the reason I pruned it so close to the stem is so as the stem continues to swell, I'm hoping you can capture that prune, which is right here on my fingertip. But the reason I've, I've, I've created it so flush is so that when it can heal over. Let me see if I can um, demonstrate a couple more that are easier. This branch over here is crossing paths with another branch. So what we're gonna do is, again, we're gonna come in as close as we can to the trunk and prune like so. And you can see that the goal is to get this as flush as possible so as the tree trunk continues to swell, it'll heal over this now exposed surface of wood. And we're gonna continue this process again. Here's another branch that's crossing. You see these two branches are in the way. 
hoping you can capture that. And so the goal is again, we're gonna come in as close as possible to the tree trunk and there's another prune. Look, you can see how smooth that is going to be accomplished. And now we've pretty much cleaned up the lower part of the tree. Now we're gonna look at the height and now start bringing the height down to within reach. So what we'll do is I'm now looking at the leaf notes. So you now have a judgment call to make of whether or not you're gonna prune here at this leaf node or this leaf node or this leaf node. And there is a difference with which leaf node you pick because if you pick this leaf node, that means the branch is gonna come out in this direction. If you pick this leaf node on that side, it's gonna go back into the center of the tree. So the goal being since we're on the left side of the tree is to encourage the branches to continue into the left direction. So we're gonna prune this at an angle. You can see I've got a 45 degree angle about a quarter of an inch above the bud. And there we prune it like so. You can see we've left about a quarter inch above the bud for that bud to continue to swell and create the future branch that'll continue the height of the tree going into the future. And now we're gonna continue this practice all the way around. And let's just watch me for the next couple of minutes reducing the height of this tree. And I'm paying attention to every single leaf and I'm trying to anticipate the future and the direction that this plant is gonna grow. Again, where I see two branches crisscrossing like this, I've gotta select, am I gonna pick the one on the right or the left? And in this circumstance, I pick um, the one on the right. So this one will come out. We're still gonna remove even that branch too to keep the center part of the tree open. Again, any crossing branches automatically come out. The goal is to have a very open and airy structure and that'll actually minimize the risk of mildew and mold within the tree as well. And disease, aphids, so on and so forth. By having an open, healthy structure with the maximum amount of leaves, getting the maximum amount of sunlight, that'll actually promote the health and the, and the, and the continued vigor and health of the tree. Check this out over here some more flower buds. If you come in a little closer, this here, right, right where I'm touching, that's a flower bud. I'm gonna go up, another flower bud. I go up, another flower bud. Just behind it, another flower bud. So what I can do now is I'll just go a couple more nodes higher and we're gonna prune like so right here. And there we go. You can see that we've got again, another 45 degree angle. The reason for the angle cuts on these as well is to minimize the risk of water collecting on the tips and thereby um, basically causing rot and mildew and disease at the tips of your apples. So you're gonna want the water to, if it rains or anything, you're gonna want it to run right off the plant. So that's the reason for the angled cuts. And now I'm just gonna continue forward. Any crisscrossing comes out again. Here's another important lesson if you can come around this way. And we'll take a look now at this apple tree. You may need to take a couple steps back, but if you take a look at the reddish green apple variety, compared to my Granny Smith apple variety, which is over here. Between these two trees, and I'm gonna step back so you can better see this, but between these two trees, you can see that the vigor and the growth on this side has not kept up with the health of this reddish green apple family favor variety. So between these two branches, this one has about 50% less branching than this branch and structure over here. So, so when I see two branches crossing as these two are over here, I don't know if hopefully you can capture that, but these two are crisscrossing right there. I'm making an X with the two branches. I've got to now decide if I'm gonna keep more of the reddish green apple variety or the Granny Smith to my left. And the answer is I've got to remove the reddish green apple and spare more of the branches of the Granny Smith so that in fact I've balanced the powers between these three varieties of apple. If I continue pruning more off the Granny Smith, it'll encourage this side to continue growing to the detriment of the other graft. So in order to balance the strength between the unions, we're gonna have to remove this branch out of the way to encourage more light and 
um, and energy into the Granny Smith side so that each of these three varieties of apple are equally receiving and, and benefiting from the light. And now to force this plant into dormancy, just as we learned today, we're gonna now strip the plant of all of the leaves, just like so. And being that this is the now first week of January, we've had some cold days, maybe a cold week. This apple tree certainly knows that we're not near spring, nor is it gonna get, begin to grow due to the pruning that we've just accomplished. Um, my general advice when it comes to pruning, and I'm um, glad I just remembered this, is to not prune until your last chance of frost has passed. Here in Los Angeles, our chance of frost passes after the first week of January. So here we are, and our last day of frost, I believe is the 7th or the 10th, um, but we're now past our last chance of frost. There will be some colder days ahead this month, and then starting February, it'll begin to warm up for us. Um, for those of you in other parts of the country, take a look at your calendar. Um, there's a lot of maps that are available, and I'll even put a link in the comments down below where you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you when that last chance of frost is for your area. It's typically, they'll give you a range of a week or two. Uh, but once you're outside of that, and just before the plant begins to go into bloom and shoot is my favorite time for pruning. And the reason for waiting until winter has clearly passed and that last chance of frost has passed is to avoid the risk of any damage to the tree due to frost. It would be a good time to do all your pruning all at the same time and not prune it in early winter or even late fall and then have to repeat it again in the spring when you notice that part of your structure of your plant is now dead. Leaving the plant alone through fall and through winter will actually offer the plant some insulation and some um, protection from the extremes of winter by just doing nothing. So there is value in doing nothing until you're outside of the risk and the chance of frost in your area. And now let's just continue. So here we are, here's our naked apple tree, finally accomplished in the first week of January. Had we not done what we did, it probably would have gone the entire month of January, possibly even February, and by February, as it does every year, this tree will go into bloom um, and more growth, and this whole cycle of dropping its leaves would be missed just because our climate is so warm. And apparently this is an issue among many growers throughout Southern California, according to the meeting that we went to this morning. I've just left a few more leaves here so we can remove that together. And now we're done. And if one other point I want to share with you is now between the three varieties of apple, one, two, and three, they're all in their own space. They all have this vase shape. And if you take a look closely, historically, when we um, formed this apple tree, it, you can see that it's got these three branches, but each of them have these strings and these stakes that were pulling each of these three branches in a position so that they wouldn't grow into one another. I created the vase by pulling them apart. If I remove the string now, you'll see that the apple tree stays in place. It only takes about a year, maybe as little as six months. It only takes a year to as little as six months for a branch, once you put it in a position, for it to actually hold and harden into that position. We can now remove this stake. We'll do the same thing going around. this tree as well. This branch here, as you can see, is supporting this branch to hold that in a position. We can now remove this. We can now remove this stake, like so. You can see that branch is now holding in place, whereas before it may have been growing too close to that branch or too close to the passion fruit that's behind us. So we've now designed that to be in that place. We can now take this off, and you can see that it's holding in the position it's supposed to be. And now we can pull these stakes out of the ground. Like so. And we've got one more over here. Take a look. We'll just cut it. And the branch holds its position. We're just going to fill those holes back in. And now we basically have our three in one apple tree, it's holding strong, it's in position, and now what we're gonna do next is a concept known as whitewashing. Let me explain the significance of whitewashing first. So the concept of whitewashing goes back hundreds and thousands of years. Originally it was done using um, limestone, 
could also be done using clay. Um, and Ivory Organics has come up with a product that's superiorly stronger, longer lasting, um, and also organic. We're gonna review all those in just a minute, but let me share with you some of these university studies that you can find at ivoryorganics.com. Let's start off with this one here. It reads, centuries proven methods, one effective and patented formula. The Ivory Organics 3 one Plant Guard as well as the whitewash formula. And it talks about whitewashing tree trunks is an old fashioned but effective method to prevent sun scald of tree bark from bright winter sunshine. So that's what we're dealing with right now is I'll explain to you in a minute. Various oils have been used for centuries to control insects and mite pests. Whitewash young trees routinely at planting. Whitewashing older trees if they develop sparse canopies or severely pruned. Natural pest control with oils generally act quickly and have low toxicity. Paint a tree chunk and lower limbs with whitewash to help prevent sunburn and damage from bores. Horticultural oils control insects, mites, and some plant diseases. Painting tree trunks with whitewash help reduce adult beetles, especially on young trees. Let me start talking about this one, the old-fashioned but effective method of preventing sun scald. Let me share this concept with you. The idea of sun scald is where the temperature um, during the day is warm and bright on the tree, and that actually can, um, results in the movement of fluid within the tree above the soil. But the ground is still cold, the ground is still moist, and the fluids within the roots are not moving. That disparity between the activity above the ground to the dormancy that's still below the ground, compounded by the nighttime freezing low temperatures that may be happening in your area, that change in temperature from that warm afternoon to that freezing night causes the bark to begin to crack. There's a tree I visited out in Redlands, an apple tree specifically, since this lesson's all on apples, which I'm gonna share with you in just a second where the tree was severely sunburned on one side and has been, during this stress that the plant has been undergoing, has still been providing the family with hundreds of pounds of apples every single year. But that side of the apple tree that was um, sun scald resulted in a barkless side of wood. And this is on the south western part of the tree which is typically the hottest part of the tree and that's where it's most exposed to light in the northern hemisphere but that part of the tree ended up losing its bark and invited termites and beetles to then enter that barkless wood and it was beginning to hollow the center of the tree what we did for that owner was we painted the tree trunk to basically minimize the continual invasion of termites and beetles within the tree and to basically create a seal any of the larvae that are within the tree will eventually work their way out we'll continue applying um, a seal to the tree, basically applying that Ivory Organics um, product to the plant and, um, and basically repeating that every about three to six months to make sure that any new holes are continuously closed until the plant eventually um, ho hopefully maintains and holds its um, rigidity. That solid wood that's within the plant that holds its structure, our goal is to hopefully maintain that so the plant can continue offering that family um, year after year successful apple harvest. What I want to share with you right now in regards to termites and beetles, if you come in a little closer, is if you take a look now that we accomplish all of this pruning over here, if you come in a little closer, you'll see that some of the larger branches, such as this over here, was one branch that we pruned. And then if you come around the back side, you can see that my pruners made a mistake, or we can blame it on myself, but you'll notice not, not only did we prune the branch, but we ended up tearing down into the bark. This is a big no-no when it comes to pruning, um, and it was done accidentally, but now we've increased the exposure of wood. What we have here is the bark, which is the protection just as our skin protects our body and our organs. Um, so the skin is the outer layer of the tree. Just underlying the bark, you may notice is a green layer of the cambium tissues and that's the living tissues and cells that are transporting the sugars and the waters within the tree so the cambium tissue underlies the bark and just under that the part i'm touching most of that white that we're feeling right here is the supporting wood structure what we're going to do now is we're going to coat this with the ivory organics three-in-one plant guard to basically create a seal to prevent the entry of termites and beetles into the wood of the tree to begin hollowing and potentially damaging the structure of the plant. So we're gonna seal it. One other thing I wanna share with you is most research will say, do not apply any tar-based products, don't apply any latex-based products to the plant as that'll create a um, watertight seal to the tree that 
will result in an anaerobic environment which will contribute towards disease and rotting on the underside of that product. Ivory Organics, on the other hand, is a porous product and that allows moisture to pass. So the Ivory Organics product creates a porous seal with the product, again, consisting of, um, let's actually review the products. Check this out. So this here is the Ivory Organics line of products. It also is available in the gallon size as well, but if you come in a little closer, you can see that it's available in the colors white and brown and green. And I wanted to share with you the inert ingredients, which consists of the iron oxide, which controls the color of the product, limestone, which is the way it's done historically, mica, which is the way it's done historically, which is a, basically a clay, milk and silica. But it's these active ingredients that basically offer the protection against rodents as well as insects. And that includes castor oil, cinnamon oil, clove oil, garlic oil, peppermint oil, rosemary oil, and spearmint oil. So these are the oils that are contained within the yellow or the gold label products. The blue ones, on the other hand, um, offer protection against damaging sunburn, um, summer sunburn, and winter sun scald. Still has the added defenses of under the active ingredients, garlic and cinnamon, but it doesn't have that whole list of seven oils to offer that maximum protection against insects if insects is the goal. And then there's this ready to use spray, which simply already has the water added. You can just shake it and then just spray it on the entire plant. And that'll um, help keep the plant several degrees cooler in the winter. It also offers some insulation to the plant. Um, when I said several degrees cooler, several degrees cooler in the summer, it'll also offer the plant insulation during the winter as well, which is the point we're gonna do right now. My recommendation is to brush it onto the, pro uh, onto the tree. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna brush it up all the way from the ground level all the way up to the tips. The goal is that we're gonna um, protect the branches from winter sun scald. We're gonna insulate the plant and we're also gonna smother the risk of any pests and insects and eggs that may be trapped within the buds. We're basically applying the product as a dormant spray. So let's get started with that. So the other thing I wanna share with you, if you're coming a little closer, you can take a look here at the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard, protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents. It also registered register material for use in organic agriculture. And on the cap here it reads, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces. So let's get started now. We'll simply take our spoon. I'm gonna open the lid here. When you open the contents, it's gonna come with your organic powder as well as a bubble wrapped oil vial. We'll take that out. Here's your oil vial. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take the powder, insert it into the can. We're gonna take some of our water, add that on top. You can begin the mixing process. And then we'll just take our oil vial, which has the seven natural garden oils, and we can add that on top. and then mix. And what we'll do is we'll fill up the contents to the top to have a full can of the Ivory Organics product. And you can see how easily the product mixes. And there we go, we've got an organic paint to apply to the tree. This one here I did right before the video is color brown, so you can see that. And then we've also got it over here, color green. And now we're gonna start applying it to the trees. We'll just go with our brush and we'll do white on the white. And I like doing three different branches because I use this for demonstration purposes to show the different colors um, in future videos. But here we go. We're gonna start coating the apple tree. And you'll notice all these leaves that are around the tree. Our apple tree is very healthy and it has been healthy for many years. If there's any risk of disease and you see that there's rust and blight and other diseases on the leaves, you're gonna to wanna to not even compost these. You're gonna to wanna to put them in your black waste and get them away from your property. But our apple tree has been consistently healthy and, and doing well. So we're gonna allow these leaves to remain in the garden and I encourage you all to do the same so that these leaves can um, break down and offer all of the nutrients that went into creating the plant to go back into the soil, feed the soil biology and that'll be returned right back into the tree come spring. So we're just gonna go as low as we can starting at the base and work our way up with the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard. I've opted to use the oils 
as we saw that there's some damaged um, and exposed areas in the wood, I'm gonna wanna make sure that those oils are there to offer pest protection. Additionally, we're using the three-in-one as a um, dormant spray or as a dormant product to basically smother out and eliminate the risk of any um, disease and pests that may be um, underlying any of the buds. So all of that's gonna be coated. The other thing too that I wanna share with you is by doing this, you're also gonna prevent the risk of premature blooms. By the tree being coated like this, what's gonna happen is the tree is gonna stay cooler longer into spring and it's not gonna push out those blooms until it's truly warmer, consistently warmer, um, which will get it, um, until it's consistently warmer, which will minimize the risk of the plant giving a false bloom and then when the temperatures dip down into freezing temperatures and damage the blossoms, that risk will be minimized by also whitewashing your plants. That's another benefit of whitewashing your trees. So again, the, um, the protection is called um, preventing the risk of premature bloom. And I want you guys to come around this side so you can see how I'm gonna coat that damaged area. So you can see here I'm coming with the product. The goal is I want you to see this and how we're now coating that exposed surface like so. And now it'll be protected over the next three to six months, offering enough time for the plant to then wake up out of dormancy and begin to expand and grow and heal over that particular wound that we just created today during our pruning project. This here was another joint right there that also had exposed wood from years past. Closer, so So being winter, the days are short and I'm out of time, but I'm gonna continue this project tomorrow morning. Um, but I hope you got to learn all the lessons and got to see all the colors on how Ivory Organics, both colors white, brown, and green, how the three-in-one products work for you, how the whitewash products work for you, and even how that ready-to-use spray can also be used in your garden to maximize the health and the life of your trees. As a thank you to all of those of you last year that have produced some videos sharing your experiences using the Ivory Organics products, I'm gonna be using your video links and posting those in the corners towards the end of this video for others to learn how you've used Ivory Organics in your garden. And if you've got the Ivory Organics products at home, please be sure to create a video. Um, you know, you can share it on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, and we'll do our part to also use our network to share that information as well. Um, so again, to those of you that have um, shared and, and, and used our videos with your audiences, we're gonna thank you by posting those in our corners to the video following this video and this educational moment. If you've liked it, be sure to like it. And most importantly, share this video with your friends and family. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe down below so that you'll be connected to all of our other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching and happy gardening.